It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedback feedbackiest day of the week. Ha! Verbal jazz hands. Uh, don't have video right now. I'm trying to sort out the picture-to-picture -picture issue that had me not have video um, in yesterday's video. The game you're looking at right now is Blockhood. It's uh, designed in part by a uh, architecture professor at the University of Southern California. So have a look, enjoy, enjoy the gameplay while I jaw at you. And there is going to be a live stream tonight at, well, tonight, tonight this afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern. That may be a funny time for some people. Some people may be jumping into the last half of it. I was gonna do it on five o'clock, but I have to be downtown for a site walkthrough after six. So I gotta push it earlier. And again, these alternate times are just for people who can't make the traditional 11 a.m. slot. Um, there were as many people at the 8 p.m. slot as there were the 11 um, a.m. slot and uh, you know 4 p.m. is late lunch break on uh, Pacific Coast of North America I'm not sure what it is um, other places around the world but we're, we're experimenting I'm trying stuff um, to see how much time zones affect things because yeah there's people watching all over the world and it's really not fair that that one group with a certain you know life rhythm uh, has more access than somebody else. So this is an experimentation which is going to come in very handy when we do the feedback group stuff for Lady Bits. And uh, so thank you for being guinea pigs. <laughs> um, I am doing this video because I find that in the feedback sessions, you guys are awesome. You ask a ton of really great questions and so the questions i prepare while the chat's building don't get addressed so i want to do this to uh answer the questions that came up during the video because those are important too um and uh the, the first one i want to address is the question of how the feedbacks on feedback on lady bits is going to work obviously there is a quality versus quantity conundrum when it comes to taking internet comments. And I really want to focus on quality. Uh, I am concerned about concern trolling, uh, people not necessarily feeling like they can speak up in a totally open forum. Uh, I do read comments. Uh, this week alone, I implemented something based on uh, somebody named Lyle on Twitter mentioned about the I wasn't aware that the the South Park World of Warcraft episode the the iteration of those characters was used as sort of a cudgel against gamers obviously I don't watch those kind of outrage warrior videos on the internet so I didn't know but obviously I don't want anybody to sort of have bad feelings about it and you know, as, as much as doing the Cartman voice would be fun, uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth sending the wrong message in that regard, triggering, you know, bad memories. Because, you know, one thing I'm, I'm very sensitive to on this project is that gamers do feel kind of beat up. And part of the reason making it fun, making it light, having cleavage, because cleavage is soft, right? But having that is is to kind of take the pressure off and, and give people a... Um, a more relaxed environment to engage with. You care about a medium enough to get upset when you feel like it's under threat. And I think people jump too close, too quickly to, well, why don't you just all calm down, you entitled so-and-sos, instead of recognizing that, no, th that caring is important and we don't want to lose that passion. Um, so... Comments will be considered online, but with a big caveat that I can't possibly accept them all. Basically, the primary source of feedback for content in the Lady Bits program will be those feedback groups. Now, um, there are going to be things done 
uh, after the Kickstarter closes to eliminate the total pay to play con uh, element of it. The thing is that it's it's just like what you know the something awful forums did back in the day. Uh, other other groups did. I know I'm rifling something awful. I'm, I'm dating myself. I know in terms of of that implementation, but the thinking, as I understand it, was that if somebody's willing to put down money, no guarantee they're not going to screw around, but they're less likely to screw around. And and uh, obviously judgment applies there as well. But that is certainly going to be the the first line of defense and I've, I've done everything I can to make it as affordable as possible. You know, those early bird spots blew out. I'm actually struggling back and forth with the fact that there is a big gap in incentives between the $25 tier and the $75 tier and donations have slowed down. I mean, that's natural after a week at a Kickstarter campaign, it's it, it you know it's like a roller coaster. It has this huge surge at the beginning and then drops precipitously. But um, still tweaking that. Um, I'm not sure what to do because I feel like it's kind of cheesy to add that quantity. But you know maybe that's something you guys can can give me some insight on. Um, Obviously, I want to control the numbers on that feedback group as well, just to make it manageable. Um, a few hundred people is a large enough sample size to be relatively certain of, of some of the ideas, but it's it's also manageable enough that we can actually have a discussion and, and dialogue and, and stuff like that. So, because uh, I, I know there are some people, it's funny, people have apologized for not being able to back and it's like, geez, guys, you know, I understand if you don't have money, uh, I, you know, you know, share it. Sharing the information is more important than people realize because after about a week, anybody maxes out their own social networks. The reason sharing matters is that it exposes different people to the project and widens the pool that backers can be drawn from. So, I mean, if, if you can't afford to back, share it with your friends, explain why, why it's important to you, why you're supporting it, you know, uh, from a, a sort of in the heart, the feels perspective, even though you can't do it financially. And you know, maybe somebody will go, okay, you can't back it, but but I can, I'll, I'll donate, you know, for you in your name kind of thing or something like that. This, this is something that can be done and it's very, very effective. And it's actually the most effective way of getting the word out uh, other than apparently YouTube. YouTube has been quite decent in terms of bringing pledges into the Kickstarter. Uh, I, I think it's because a lot of people don't read news websites anymore. They've lost so much faith in them. So uh, the other question I got was guests or interviews during Lady Bits, am I going to have them? Yeah, I've got a few. I've got a few people willing to come on and, and talk. Um, a lot of them are gamers, not gaming industry professionals, because the gaming industry professionals can't go on the record. They're afraid they're going to get in trouble or fired. So what, what I've done with the gaming pros I've spoken to is that they're going to submit anonymous written comments. Like I've, I know who they are, but I am not going to reveal those sources so they can speak freely about their experiences and not get in trouble. And let me tell you, some of the the anecdotes, some of the stories I have heard, it's going to be awesome because they're so counter wow. to what, you know, the powers that be, the expectations that are set. And that's what I really like. I mean, of course, I want the stories that, that do fall into that. Um, <laughs> But I want the good stories, too. I, I want the un, unexpected stories. That's journalism. You know, the difference between journalism and, like, like uh, academic statistics are that, you know, journalism's kind of the, the... The statistics are the what, right? The, the journalism really 
does that sort of why and the how. And the thing about statistics is, okay, we have this number, and that's why surveys are important, but we don't necessarily why know why people answered the way they do. You, you have to interview people to get those reasons. And so the two things really do work in tandem. So I hope that answered that question. Um, the, and one person said they prefer my documentary style videos, which I'm hoping Lady Bits is part of. I'm assuming they mean like Gamer's Guide to Feminism, things like that. They'd like to see more of those. Just so people know, the reason I don't do more of those is those are way more expensive than economies of scale on the internet usually allow. And that's why I decided to crowdfund Lady Bits um, to make videos profitable online you really have to watch the costs and a huge part of the cost is time literally how much time it takes you to make a video that is the bulk of costs in any in any creative endeavor and but you should do it because you love it you shouldn't expect to get paid nah <laughs> you know th that's a great way for people to not make content there there has to be a way to be compensated for your work when we have a series like Lady Bits, the amazing thing is it's paid for, right? So if I have to spend a lot of time on one episode and less time on another, because one just happens to be more challenging, I can do that because I've already gotten paid. So I can just focus on um, making the video as good as it possibly can be instead of chasing trends that are gonna be searchable. But one of the things we've already shown one of the narratives we've already sort of at least poked a hole in, if, if not shattered, is this recent assertion that gamers have issues with women being funny. That they, they are so, you know, soggynies, misogynies, that, oh, women can't be funny. We just shouldn't try. We should just deliver our information and not try to tell jokes. And the, the Monday video, the response to the Monday video completely blew that out of the water. I mean, you guys were so great. You got the joke. You got all, all the little things I put in. Humor is subjective. Comedy is subjective. And, you know, you do it long enough, you recognize that one group may not find you funny at all. Another group will find you hilarious. And, and that's, that's just the nature of, of comedy. And so this, this idea that gamers are somehow threatened by funny women it's it's just not so and you know one of the one of the elements of this whole process is the idea that i'm going to try things i'm going to challenge these assertions that people have made to, to test if they actually can be replicated you know and i am fully prepared to go well in this case the established narrative is right, but a lot of cases it's wrong. And what I've found through this journey is so far, more of it's wrong than right. And uh, I, I will say though, one thing that you guys may have seen this stuff about our girl gamers. And I mean, most of that was a garbage fire with, you know, body shaming and straw manning and, and uh, you know, all, all the things about subreddits that bleh. but one question was raised well, it wasn't really a question it was an assertion but i'd like to address it because i think of, of all you know within all the garbage i think this one was valid they they really checked me on and i stand by this statement i still stand by it um the idea that it's better for a show about gaming to be made by an actual gamer now someone on this subreddit interpreted that as saying that a newcomer to gaming's opinions and experiences are completely invalid and this is a false binary that is not the case there is a massive difference between someone's experiences being you know invalid and someone's experiences just being less contextualized and informed by somebody who has been around and active much longer it's a level of expertise issue. We, we need to bring in a certain amount of new gamers so that um, 
the people who do laps because of life or finances or, or whatever, or just lack of interest now. Um, as people exit the gaming hobby, we need to bring in new players to replace and grow the, the player base. And of course that's true. And balancing um, accessibility for newcomers and uh, a satisfactory experience for experienced uh, gamers, that, that's, a, that's a big challenge of game design. That's a huge part of it. However, when you're talking about uh, historical context, when you're talking about how gamers access games, when you're talking about um, discussion of game design, how games work, uh, the development process, I think experience does matter. I think somebody being able to, to reach back and go, no, I am not just aware of games before uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System had to be marketed as a toy instead of a game and, and therefore was, uh, you know, subject to artificial marketing gendering. I, re I remember the Atari, I remember the uh, ColecoVision, the Commodore 64, the Intellivision, those games that were marketed at families, not just guys, uh, and certainly not just young guys. I mean, if you look at the box art for the original Atari, it's pretty obvious the target was families, you know, children of all ages kind of thing. Um, I think it's important to not just read about that. I think it's important to be able to engage with that and say, no, look, like the experience back then was not the, oh, you're a girl, you're weird, that that it, it has been in some circle subsequently. I can also speak because I've been around long enough that things have actually gotten way better in the last 10 years. You know, it, it much like all other entertainment consumer goods, you know, in, in the, the mid nineties, the marketing, just the marketing, not the products guys don't freak out. The marketing got increasingly gendered. And, and that is in part because of the divisions, the, the way, uh, commercial, the way, uh, television, cable television, fragmented viewing patterns, game marketers were forced to choose. Now that is lessening now. And, and with that lessening comes, uh, more accessibility, less rigid. Well, we have to pick this demographic based on gender, which I quite frankly think is artificial. I think that, um, marketers put too much uh, emphasis on identity politics, demographics, and not enough emphasis on area of interest. You know, uh, if you're going to play Forza, for instance, it's more important that you like cars than that you're a male between the ages of 18 and 35 that makes over $50,000 a year. You know what I mean? And so this is one of those historical context things where yeah, you can read up on it and yeah, you can be schooled, but it's very different to have been there. And it's very different to have had the experience of what it was actually like to really experience intensely hostile sexism um, 15, you know, 10, 15 years ago. There's a lack of perspective that I think really matters. And I think that's what makes my perspective a lot different than some of these newcomers. They only see the bad. Whereas I see, oh man, you know, yeah, there's, there's, there's things that every industry has to work on, but we're going in the right direction. And I've seen too many groups not be rewarded for the improvements they have, um, achieved not good enough not good enough not good enough and so those improvements collapse because if you don't reward moving in the right direction it doesn't make sound business sense to continue to move in that direction if you're not getting any benefits from this initiative will you scrap the initiative and move on to something else and that's a completely fair perspective hence the you know why should game developers complain about accusations of sexism
I think that's a fair question to ask. And um, it's funny how many people on message boards are saying, these questions are easy. And I look at their answers and it's like, yeah, that's one perspective and it's a valid perspective. And that's fine that you think that. But the whole purpose of this program is is to recognize that, yeah, you can think that and that's totally valid. But then somebody else can look at something out, come at it from another perspective. And that's equally valid. And this is what we have to recognize so we can really be truly inclusive and not leave anyone who wants to play and have fun out. And you'll note that distinction was very specific. Um, but that is, I want to address that because even, you know, even when people are clearly just personalizing something and um, going after me for personal reasons or, or issues of identity, it's still important to read stuff because, you know, a broken clock being right twice a day meaning is means that's two more things I didn't know had I not engaged in that criticism. Was that especially fun? No. It's never fun to read stuff you feel is unfair that isn't isn't hitting you for things you actually did that you screwed up on, things that are assumptions that are extrapolating what uh what I said instead of actually dealing with what I said. And people do that a lot. And I feel kind of displaced because I understand that is human nature. But don't forget, I spent years as a games, you know, evil, evil games journalist, trying to avoid precisely that, trying to avoid extrapolating because you extrapolate too far and you actually misrepresent a person's viewpoint. And so, that's why I think part of the disconnect is people are, are reading and hearing what they're afraid of as opposed to what's actually there. And I think a lot of these naysayers, if they keep an open mind, are going to be pleasantly surprised by the program. I mean, these people who continue to call me trans exclusive, I, I, I lost, I completely just lost my temper on somebody because I know them like we have spent meat space time together and they threw the the trans exclusionary thing at me in public and it just it pissed me off because I cannot stand the I know you don't hate trans people but what you did was transphobic argument how is that possible if you know I have no hate in my heart then it is a misunderstanding it is not phobic phobic means fear you know the implication is that you hate or fear a group that is not the same as issues of normalization issues of normalization normalization takes time it took decades to normalize gay and lesbian people outside of the stereotypes it is going to take time for people to get their heads around you know, pronouns becoming more tricky. And some people are going to resist that much more than others. People, as far as we know, some people are more hardwired to accept change than others. So for those people that are less innately capable of dealing with change, of rolling with the punches, this is going to be a difficult process for them. And all this trans exclusionary stuff does is alienate those people. And those people are people too. If it truly is an innate state, if this is a nature versus nurture thing, or it is just so ingrained in them from their upbringing that it is difficult for them to go against that grain, that is not a person's fault. And I can see the argument that people feel very, very scared about the idea that they have to learn 42 different pronouns today or else they're going to be shunned as a terrible person. And there are people that actually believe that that's on the horizon. I don't. But I can completely understand why people would be resistant to tackling this issue at all. But 
I think there's more to it than this. And, and one of the reasons I really lost it on this person, because this person is not transgender. And I have, you know, friends who are transgender and I have seen a tiny, tiny part of how, how difficult that process of accepting yourself is. I really take issue with people and they don't even realize they're doing this, but people using transgender rights as a way to grandstand on the internet. And anytime you're publicly shaming someone, you're using a word phobic or exclusionary or something like misogyny or sexist or homophobic or all that stuff. Anytime you, you use that word in another person's direction regarding their behavior, not you know, a scene or not a hypothetical, their actual behavior. When you level that accusation at them in public, that is a public shaming. And people don't react well to that because that puts them in a really tough spot. Anybody who has spent any time with any sort of progressive circles knows that the expected response there is just to grovel and apologize. And people can't do that sincerely until they realize what they did wrong. And it's much easier, it's much more effective to take someone aside and go, you know, look, I know you don't mean anything by this. I just want to let you know that the, the more correct term this week is this. I'm not telling you have to change. I'm just letting you know. So if you want to, you can change it. I, I don't think it's right that the issues surrounding transgendered people um, are used as this cudgel by people that don't have to live with it every day. I am a, I, and this is just personally my thing. I know there are multiple sides to this, the whole allies issue. I hate the term feminist allies for the same reason I'm going to get into it here. The best person to tell the story of their experience is that person. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have, you know, structural help from other people who might be better writers or better communicators or whatever, but the core information has to come from that individual. And I'm really careful. I, I would rather, if, if I'm going to delve into a topic like the, the transgendered experience, I don't believe there is a single transgendered experience. I believe that every transgendered individual has their own experience. And so I would be much more comfortable having a guest on who is, who is trans telling their story than me attempting to create this blanket thing about a, about, you know, the tr being trans in North America, because even though I'm, you know, highly gender non-conforming in some ways, I don't identify as transgender. When I was a teenager, I might have. I was, there, there were periods where I was really, I, I didn't feel, I, I did have days where I'm like, man, if only I'd been born a, a boy. But I never felt like I actually was born a boy in a woman's body. Very different thing. You know, I, I there were points that I felt like, my reactions to things and my um, the way I responded, the way I did were were more in accordance of what a man was supposed to be than a woman. And let me tell you, those were hard years. You know, those were really hard years. So, you know, putting myself in the position of somebody who who is beyond that, who has the you know, firm and unshaking belief in their soul, in the core of their being, that their, you know, what chromosomes would come up on a DNA test doesn't reflect what they feel they are, you know, just based on how I had to struggle. That's, you know, factors multiplying factors worse to feel that way because you constantly feel 
like you're hiding something. You constantly feel like you're misleading people. And that's why pronouns are so important. Every time somebody says he and you don't feel like a he, you feel, or at least some people feel, like they are deceiving people. They are being deceptive by responding to that pronoun. And the case this week was the whole Lady Bits title. The name of the show is not Vagina, you know? And this is where I go, oh, no, 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 no. Don't you accuse me of being trans exclusionary because in your own mind, you think Lady Bits means default body part. It's not that. And nobody checked and everybody just ran off thinking that, but it's their thinking that is exclusionary towards transgendered people, not my choice of title. And that's why I updated the FAQs because I was sick of this. I was not going to be the scapegoat for their own narrow-minded thinking. Most people, if there's somebody right in front of them, they may think it's weird, but they will do their best to accommodate them. I mean, I do work with this one church and they, they don't understand kosher. They just know that, that we don't eat pork. And it's, you know, it's easy for me because, uh, you know, I'm a pescatarian. So they know I don't eat meat at all. It solves the problem. And, and so, you know, the solution is pretty much, okay, vegetarian food, fine, easy. No problem. Because there's no meat in that. So you're not mixing milk and meat. And you're not getting the shellfish and everything like that. Just telling people, just make it vegetarian solves a lot of problems in terms of kosher style food. But that isn't, that, that, that is absolute, that's not just tolerance, that's togetherness. And I don't need them to have a perfect understanding of kashruth, you know, Jewish dietary laws, to, to appreciate that. It, it's, that is somebody showing they care. And that's, I believe, what most people are really like. Certainly most gamers are really like. I think gamers are... Um, I can't prove this, but it's, it's my, you know, personal bias that gamers are open to new experiences more than the average person just because we play games, which involves learning new sets of rules with every new game. But that's why if you saw me like flip out on someone this week, that's why. And I'm not going to apologize for it. I don't believe in apologizing for losing your temper when any, any person in their right mind would lose their temper. So I've gone on at length about this and, and this is why I'm doing this now and instead of during the stream because there would be like pages and pages and pages of comments racked up by this point on this stream. And, you know, if I've offended anybody by what I said, I really wish you'd find better uses for your energy because this is just my opinion. This is my feeling and it did not intend to offend anybody. I'm not going to apologize if you're offended because there was no ill intent. I only apologize when I think I've done something wrong. The only way we actually come together, the only way we really get these new concepts is if we talk about it and we allow people to express their points of view and not jump all over them for using the wrong words. I am so irritated by that because these people claim systems of oppression while forcing people to use certain words or else is a system of oppression. Class is expressed through language. So yeah, people who can't afford to go to university or people did not have the opportunities to go to university for various reasons don't have, have those million dollar words that you do. No, they don't. But you are oppressing them by forcing them to use a vocabulary they are not comfortable with instead of checking your own privilege and recognizing it's easier for you to come down and you to use a language that they understand than expecting them to adopt a lexicon that they were never taught. You know, populism is not all bad. There, there's a purpose for it. And the arrogance in thinking you can throw these collegial terms at people who are just getting by. You know, they work 14 hour days, manual labor, in jobs that are slowly killing them so their kids can have a better life and they're told they're terrible people. That makes no sense. 
that is the person who has a liberal arts degree and a job at their family's company thinking they can tell people who had a, f a lot fewer opportunities what to do. You know, people don't go out and go out and work right after high school or they drop out of high school to go out and work. People don't do that because they want to. Everybody says, stay in school, stay in school, stay in school. They do that because they feel they have to. Either school is not for them or there are immediate financial needs that they have to satisfy. As well, this education, education, education thing, that's all great. But unless you're like Nicki Minaj and paying off people's student debts, what are you doing to facilitate that for other people? That's the question that everybody should be asking before they go and shame someone for not using the right words. And, you know, this is what makes me fundamentally different from a lot of people talking, tackling these issues in gaming right now. These people who had these financial requirements, who had these financial challenges, were my peers. They weren't some statistic in a video I saw in college that I'm now suddenly going to get woke and care about. You know, when you're in a neighborhood where you hear gunshots at night, yeah, you're woke because they wake you up in the middle of the night. Oh, whoa, crap. But anyway, I'll stop ranting. That's Feedback Friday for the week. Live stream at 4 p.m. Hope you guys enjoy. See you this afternoon.